yeah, I, initially I found it a little hard uh, because the talk was mainly about me. So I yeah, started with uh, looking at uh, what uh, yeah, Ubicomp uh, at Sigi University was doing. And then uh, yeah, I created this talk, uh, Time Series Data Wrangling Applied to Ubiquitous Computing. Um, so um, yeah, I was first give an overview. Uh, initially, I will start with yeah, talking about me a little, uh, what I do. And then I uh, divide on what I work into two parts, uh, mainly the open source software development part, and then the application of those uh, open source software packages to my yeah, more applied research that I do, which has a tight link with ubiquitous computing. Um, so yeah, I will first uh, start with yeah, those open source uh, packages, mainly Potly Resampler uh, and then TS Flex. Uh, then yeah, I will have some opinion on how to make uh, impact in academics uh, and uh, then more of the applied uh, research projects on which I work, uh, which is uh, Ambrain. Uh, that is a research project where we uh, use wearables and smartphones to actually track patients diagnosed with primary headache disorders to um, yeah, look at their daily behavioral lifestyle patterns. Uh, are there some yeah, triggers in their, or yeah, changes in their daily lifestyle when a headache attack is nearing? Can we detect it? So that is uh, what uh, that study uh, covers. Uh, finally, I will uh, show some yeah, maybe collaboration uh, ideas. Uh, so, um, we will get started. So who am I? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, I'm a yacht movement uh, leader, a uh, nature lover, and I'm an identical twin. And actually, uh, my twin brother is also a colleague at our research group. So uh, yeah, the world is uh, rather small, I would say. Uh, yeah. Next to this, I'm also a sports uh, enthusiast, mainly cycling and running. And of course, uh, I'm a free open source software lover. Um, my main contributions uh, reside within the Python and C domain. Uh, and uh, as of uh, yeah, one week ago, I have a baby cat. Uh, his name is uh, Wilco, and uh, yeah, here he's sitting on my lap. Um, but uh, who, who am I more work uh, related? So uh, in 2015 till 2019, I did my yeah, studies uh, as a master of uh, science and electronics and ICT engineering technology, and my focus was embedded systems. So already a little more focus on the sensors, the inertial movement units, and microcontrollers. After that, yeah, I started as a researcher at our research group. Uh, it's a Predict Idea research group. Um, it's mainly a research group focused on data analysis and internet technologies uh, at Ghent University. Uh, as for now, I'm on yeah, research grant uh, FWO, Fonds uh, Wetenschappelijk Onderzoek is the Dutch name. Uh, and I still have uh, three and a half years on that grant. So I still have a lot of time to actually finish my PhD because I started in 2019. Um, and um, yeah, the research uh, topics that I work on are mainly multimodal time series bi biosignals. Um, I worked uh, a little on the uh, sleep staging. Uh, so you use clinical data from uh, yeah, sleep clinics. Uh, so you have yeah, like uh, several yeah, high frequency uh, data modalities such as EEG da data, ECG data, and you want to actually use that to classify sleep stages. Uh, I worked on that. But uh, next to this, I also collaborate with a psychologist and neurologist uh, to yeah, make these uh, ambulatory studies uh, or transition clinical knowledge to ambulatory uh, environments. And this is actually where ubiquitous computing comes uh, into play uh, and what, uh, this, uh, what will mainly be covered in this talk. Also, I work a little bit on speech data as I actually did my uh, master thesis uh, on speech data, but uh, that is not uh, that relevant for this talk, so I will uh, skip uh, that part. Um, so what do I work on part one? Uh, the open source uh, software development. Um, so I get all those multimodal uh, time series biosignals. Uh, what do I want to do with that data? Actually, I just want to wrangle it and use it then for my downstream tasks. So I get it raw data and I want first to look at the data, maybe transform it, clean, enrich it. And then I get my tidy data, uh, which I will then use uh, actually to, um, yeah, for the downstream task, being insights, modeling, uh, and so forth. But throughout that whole uh, process, exploration is a key component. Certainly when you deal with multimodal high frequency signals, it's hard to grasp whether your, yeah, for example, your low pulse filter is that it is rather effective for the yeah, objective you want to have. So you need to visual, visually analyze or look whether it does not filter out some unwanted component of your uh, data or, or, yeah. So, um, yeah. To properly do this, you need to write tools, but 
yeah, existing tools did not really meet my and my team's uh, re requirements. So the first uh, challenge I embarked upon was, can we improve this uh, time series data wrangling and make an academic impact? And actually the answer is yes, through open source packages. Um, so um, actually uh, in the first part, I will talk about two packages, a Potly Resampler, which is mainly used for that exploration part of the data wrangling process, and TS Flex, which is used for the data uh, wrangling part. So actually transforming uh, feature extraction and enriching your data uh, by applying those yeah, filters uh, or creating a signal quality index. Uh, so these two packages uh, I will cover now, and I will start with the exploration part being Plotly Resampler. Um, so uh, the first thing we did was, yeah, I stated it did not meet my requirements, but what are my requirements for that effective time series uh, visualization? So first of all, we're all data scientists. So actually, we want that these tools are integrable in conventional data science environments. For example, I do not want to work with a yeah, QT uh, independent application. I want it to be able to integrate within my, for example, Jupyter or in my Visual Studio Code uh, notebooks or uh, PyCharm. So that is my first requirement. Next to this, as I work with high frequency data components, I want to, yeah, I want to have an interactive tool. I want to zoom in on events of interest and look uh, there and see more data details. And as these data modalities are really large, I want it to be scalable to more than a million of data points, whilst being highly configurable because every use case needs another graph construction or a graph construction yeah, configuration. And of course, it needs to be convenient to use. Uh, otherwise, other people would not use it. So when I looked then at the popular Python visualization landscape, I saw that most tools met the integration uh, requirements, but the interactiveness uh, was not met by um, mainly battle matplotlib, as it yeah, just renders static uh, figures. Uh, and the scalability was even not met by any of those packages, um, because um, they all slow down tremendously um, when you want to visualize large amounts of data. And this is actually the key insight of uh, yeah, what I got then is because all these packages aim to render all the data points into the front end, into the view, which the users see. But when you have like 100 million data points, it might, and you have a limited screen space, it's not that relevant to show all that data points. So you might separate that. You might want to show just only some data points out of interest or an aggregation of that data, which is highly relevant. Uh, to the user and when he or she zooms in, you might uh, send more data to that front end. And this is actually what Plotly Resampler does. So as a result, yeah, I created Plotly Resampler. And yeah, as the name states, it's actually not a new visualization library, but is an add-on to an existing library. Um, and what does it do? It just um, yeah, uh, yeah, renders data points, uh, yeah respective to the front-end view of the user. For example, when the user zooms in in a region, it will yeah, render more data points of that user. So when you have a lot of signals, you still have a detailed uh, view when you zoom in, but it's still rather interactive and snappy. Uh, and yeah, here I showed that it's integrable in, Jupiter, uh, in VS Code. Uh, here I use it in Jupyter. It's a dashboard which I use to process some uh, ECG signal. I look at the signal quality indices. Uh, here I use it uh, to process some skin conductance uh, signal uh, in PyCharm. And um, here um, I uh, yeah, try to uh, embed it in Google Colab and that worked as well. Um, so um, yeah, now I will just uh, show a quick demo uh, of how uh, I use, for example, that toolkit where I use it to um, yeah, uh, on off to create an on off wrist uh, SQI for the Empathica E4. So uh, I Assume uh, most of you know the Empathica E4. It's a risk worn uh, wearable, uh, which we actually also use in the Embrain study as wearable to uh, gather uh, yeah, data. And then we use uh, that wearable uh, on the users and they stream their data in real time to the clouds. And then we use that to create some uh, machine learning predictions, but we also use it for data analysis. And now we're actually looking at uh, the movement of users with respect to their headaches. Do they uh, move less or more when a headache is nearing or not? But what we also saw, uh, thanks to these visual analytics, is that sometimes users are still 
uh, yeah, are still connected to the phone with their wearable, but they are not wearing it. For example, when you're was washing your hands, you might take off that wearable or when you're taking a shower. Uh, and actually, yeah, to perform a qualitative analysis, we need to omit these uh, data points. So you need to create a uh, signal quality index, which can predict whether the user or yeah, which can state whether the user is wearing the wearable or not. So actually, for this use case, you might want to use uh, yeah, Plotly Resampler to actually validate your algorithm that you create on a lot of data, because otherwise you have a small restricted space on which you will validate. And thanks to uh, Plotly Resampler, you can um, actually uh, validate it on uh, more uh, data. So uh, yeah, I will just uh, rerun uh, that notebook. Um, so the first thing I do is actually yeah, importing all the libraries I uh, need, so mainly Plotly Resampler, um, and then also some processing steps from TSFX, the second package I will use, to create uh, that logic of um, calculating that uh, SQI. So the first thing I do is like um, uh, calculating the variance of, a, of an activity signal modality. For example, uh, I, I remarked that it didn't matter which uh, activity uh, yeah, vector uh, I used, uh, it, which uh, accelerometer vector I used. So I uh, just used accelerometer X. Uh, I calculated the uh, standard deviation on a rolling manner. Um, then um, I uh, used, uh, and then I created several SQIs. So I created a, a skin conductance SQI. So the skin conductance level must be higher than 0 0.03. Uh, the skin temperature must be higher than 32 degrees, and that activity uh, index value, so the standard deviation of the accelerometer x value, must be higher than 0 0.1. And that is the uh, uh, TSGET, uh, uh, the ADI SQI uh, output name, temp SQI output name, and AI SQI output name. And you can actually already see these uh, signal quality indices here. Um, I think I did not show. Uh, I do show the uh, AI SQI. I can already see that, for example, the uh, AI SQI will get uh, lower values. Uh, yeah, I restarted the notebook, so the interactiveness is uh, lost. So I'll just quickly run the other things. Um, so, uh, for example, when I zoom in here, uh, you will see that actually the um, yeah, AI SQI works rather fine when the yeah when the user is yeah, not wearing the wearable. The, uh, ADI value here is really low. So yeah, the ADI SQI will output a low value, which you see here. Also here, the user is not wearing the wearable uh, anymore. So um, when you look at the temperature curve, it will yeah, have a steep drop and then use an exponential uh, decreasing um, value towards this, yeah, the room temperature, I uh, presume. Uh, and also when you look at the uh, accelerometer uh, SQI, you can see that actually it is also a low value here. And then we output, yeah, when we look again at the processing, we fuse these SQIs using an OR operator, and then we create some smoothing, and uh, then we get actually the wrist SQI. And the wrist SQI uh, states whether the variable is on the wrist or not. And we actually see that it works rather well, we would presume. But as an extra sanity check, I added the BVP value, blood volume pulse, because when the variable is not worn, no light will be reflected back because uh, yeah, you have no uh, surface uh, against the wearable, which will be able to uh, yeah, reflect back uh, the light from those uh, PPG sensors. So we, uh, yeah, we would expect that we get a really low BVP value, and, th and that is the case. So this sanity check uh, is also um, then uh, yeah, visually performed, and uh, we, we see then that the uh, rest SQI actually works rather well. Uh, here again, um, here we have also a really low uh, risk uh, value. Uh, so yeah, we can, I mean, again, the drop in the temperature, uh, low EDA value, low uh, accelerometer value. So we can now, yeah, visually uh, see whether the um, yeah, algorithm works well or not on a lot of data. Um, because like BVP is, I think, uh, 64 hertz of the uh, Empatica. And for our whole day, that are already a couple of million of data points. And to render that with another tool, it will not be feasible. So this way, Plotly Resampler helps us uh, actually to yeah, visually validate those data enhancing steps of the data wrangling uh, process. Um, so now uh, we've landed at the second part, uh, uh, at the intermezzo, I think. Uh, uh, oh, no, no, at the second part of the data wrangling, uh, how I deal with that challenging data. So. Yeah, data from real life settings, it's not perfect. So you need to enhance or create SQ SQIs 
or do proper signal processing. For example, the skin conducting signal, the clinical settings, you measure it at the uh, yeah, points of your fingertips. Uh, it has a high, yeah, uh, yeah, it's a high frequency signal. Uh, it's, it is really accurate, but in real life, you measure it often at the wrist because it's less intrusive. Uh, when you move, you have movement artifacts, uh, sensors degrade over time, and all these things uh, can cause a really noisy signal. I cannot use it uh, as default uh, signal for analysis. Additionally, uh, current toolboxes, for example, clinical uh, analysis of the skin conductance uh, signals are not suited for such large amounts of data, for example, um, in the Ambrane study. We uh, let the participants wear the wearable for 90 days. And if we want to analyze 90 days of wearable data, um, yeah, it cannot be loaded at once in such a toolbox while it can be yeah, processed at once with, or yeah, in a, in a batch based manner with our tools that we create. So, so to yeah, enhance again these signals, you need proper tools. Um, and again, these tools uh, yeah, we built because uh, mainly TS Flex is the name of the tool, because they did not meet again our requirements. Uh, for example, for the time series data wrangling, uh, there are two components, three, two or three components, time series processing. So this is actually like the filtering, the SQI creation, which I showed uh, beforehand. And that is actually rather convenient to realize. Uh, time series processing can be seen. Um, I don't know whether you're um, familiar with Escalar, but with an, as an Escalar pipeline, you uh, set a pipeline of all the processing steps uh, which you will apply, and these will be applied sequentially. As a result, you have this a deterministic process of all the steps you will apply. And actually, that's still rather convenient to realize or self code. But feature extraction is already a little more complex because, uh, for some other research projects, we see that um, the time series data is really, um, yeah heterogeneous. Uh, for example, you can have a data sample at different sample frequency. There might uh, occur gaps in your data, and most tools do not uh, make the assumption that this can occur. So they, they, they assume that the data is uh, sampled at a fixed interval or that there are no gaps. So actually, you need some kind of tools which are able to deal with these properties. And this is actually what uh, TS Flex does. And, uh, yeah, it's mainly focuses on that effective part for the feature uh, extraction. And uh, one of those uh, key uh, yeah, deltas that TS Flex uh, delivers to other packages is that it uh, serves multiple window stride configurations. Uh, what does that mean? Um, for example, you have a time series data, and then you have, for example, a window. Uh, and this window is shifted two times forward with a step size of a stride. Uh, so this is a single window stride configuration, but uh, for example, uh, you're looking at heart rate data, uh, and and here you can uh, yeah calculate the slope of your heart rate or yeah, the max uh, increase, max decrease, but you have that limited temporal context. For example, one minute because your window is one minute. It might also be relevant to get a larger temporal context. The temporal also uh, includes features in that feature vector of with a window of five minutes, and then you actually need a larger window that is also incorporated at that same timestamp for actually yeah, making them that prediction. And this is what TS Flex does. It's, um, it serves a holistic interface to actually define uh, those uh, multiple window stride combinations to conveniently calculate uh, features on multiple windows. Uh, and actually, um, yeah, this uh, gave us a uh, yeah, this was not that proper research and literature yet. And actually, uh, with this, we could outperform deep learning sleep models um, uh, by using simply a linear mo model and using uh, multiple window stride com uh, configurations to actually create the state of the art for several sleep staging data sets. So actually, using these techniques is really relevant. You still can uh, yeah, retain the advantages of classical machine learning uh, as you use them and not uh, shift towards the yeah, sequence to sequence based models, which are uh, where you need more data and uh, are harder to train. Um, so this is uh, what TS Flex does. It uh, also does not make an assumption about the sampling regularity or whether multiple series are aligned. For example, when you work with multimodal data, you might have data from um, wearables, uh, data from uh, from uh, the smartphone, and these are not all data points are not aligned perfectly. But using TS Flex, you can define yeah a, win a time based window and a time based stride, and it will just use data within that time period to calculate the features, for example. And as a result, you, you do not need to worry to uh, 
properly align each time a data point to uh, the other data points exactly. So yeah, it's it's yeah serves the end user a lot of uh, hassle. Additionally, uh, TSFlex supports all data types. It can deal with time based uh, values, for example, a duration to complete a task as a, a data point. Uh, it can deal with categorical, bool based, uh, yeah, numeric based uh, data types. And actually, we did not uh, focus with TSFlex to um, yeah, also integrate features in our toolkits, uh, feature uh, calculation. We just focus on integrating with other packages that already serve that functionality. Um, so what does uh, TS Flex do? Uh, our philosophy is it does, we do not want to reinvent uh, the wheel or um, re-implement the wheel uh, more concretely because we just aim to integrate with all these feature extraction packages and just use their functionality, which is already properly tested and validated by the community and just serve a lot of flexibility on how you want to calculate those features, for example. Um, and yeah, so as I said before, you have that multiple window stride configuration. We do not make any assumption about sampling rate, data alignment, or data type. And we also serve chunking uh, functionality. What does that uh, chunking uh, do? For example, when you have your time series data, you might specify the frequency of that time series data is around four hertz, for example, for the scan conductance signal of Empatica. And users wear that wearable, but sometimes the connection can uh, get lost or the wearable needs to be charged. And that chunking will determine the continuous chunks of data that the user has collected. And then you can actually process uh, the data per chunk and not to deal with those gap periods. Uh, and that is also a rather convenient way to actually pre-process your data. Um, and also, when we look at the efficiency of our package, it's uh, yeah, rather efficient. So here, uh, we actually created a benchmark for a strided window feature extraction. I think we um, created uh, yeah, one hour of data, of synthetic data sampled at 1,000 hertz, and we calculated features on uh, windows of 30 seconds. And we did that. We calculated the same features using uh, four packages, TS Fresh, Seglorm, TS Fell, and TS Flex. You can see that um, TS Fresh actually uh, has a peak memory reusage during that calculation over three uh, gigabytes. Um, Seglern, yeah, nearest 300 megabytes, and uh, TS Fell and uh, nearest uh, three megabytes. Well, yeah, our toolkit only uses uh, one and a half megabytes and uh, is able to finish that whole feature extraction process under one second. Uh, so that is rather uh, significant to put it uh, in bar charts. Uh, we are, uh, yeah, when we use TS Fresh as baseline, TS Flex in its multi processing variant is over 200 times as fast as uh, TS uh, Fresh. Uh, and we are uh, also really memory efficient. Uh, so, yeah, this is also uh, an added uh, value of our toolkits. Uh, and now I will, uh, for example, uh, yeah, show a demo where I use it to, um, yeah. Create, calculate some features on a, a signal processing uh, pipeline that are also created to TS Flex. Um, so um, I will just uh, go to my demo. Okay. So um, again, actually the same um, thing uh, I do. Uh, so I import libraries. I yeah. Uh, import the data that I will use. Uh, and I already process uh, data using the uh, signal processing uh, pipeline uh, I created for the signal, uh, for the skin conducting signal. Then um, I create, for example, a feature collection where I uh, yeah, add multiple features. Uh, and I will uh, calculate features on the skin conductance responses uh, we detected. And I will do that on a window of 60 seconds, uh, 120 seconds, 300 seconds. For example, I will also do. Um, 800 seconds um, to show that it's, yeah, that it uh, works. Then I get uh, FC out. Uh, I just calculate the features. I will just uh, quickly show them. Um, and I get a, a re really readable output name of a uh, skin conductance response uh, that of the name of that signal, then uh, which function I applied. Um, yeah, it was a lambda function, so it does not state any function name. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it, it does state the function name SCRR uh, here. Um, and then, um, or I can put just here rate, SCRR rate, and it will just uh, I put SCRR rate. Um, and then the windows. Um, so uh, 800 seconds was apparently uh, 13 uh, minutes and 20 seconds. So uh, it states on which window the features were calculated, and then it states the stride. 
Yeah, so, and then, um, for example, I want to incorporate this with my, uh, yeah, signal, um, uh, with my uh, visual analytics. So here you can see the uh, 800 seconds uh, skin conductance response rate. And what do we see? Where all the skin conductance responses are detected, we see an increase in skin conductance response rate. We can, for example, look and we see ah, the skin conductance signal processing still misses some peaks, but um, the the sig that signal seems to uh, yeah, be right. So yeah, we can we still need to improve that processing step, but uh, the skin conductance uh, yeah the TS flex feature uh, does work. So this is uh, the demo for for example um, yeah actually uh, using. Um, TS Flex to really calculate features on the fly. Here you can also see that there are gaps in the data. TS Flex is able to deal with that um, conveniently. Um, so yeah, this eases really the process of wrangling with your data. Um, um, uh, other example that I can show is, um, I think uh, this uh, example. So here I actually use data from the mBrain study. So this is uh, actually data from those headache patients. Um, here you can see like um, the red square is a headache attack. And um, here we uh, show the uh, skin conductance data. So the um, yeah, EDA or electrodermal activity data. For example, we can now zoom in on some um, data that we collected here. We can see were there any skin conductance responses detected? Yeah, were these valid? Uh, and we can then zoom in a little more. Mm, no, these were mainly detected because there's here this decrease and mainly the phasic will be uh, here will here have a peak because the uh, tonic will go lower, uh, I presume. Um, wait, I think it's, it's like, no. yeah, because the tonic will go lower because of this uh, drop. So here we can actually perform proper visual analysis of our yeah, algorithms that we use. Are these um, skin conductance responses that we detect here valid? You can quickly look at them. Yeah, here uh, most uh, skin conductance responses were that uh, we detected were valid. Um, so actually, yeah, we can now use all these tools together to actually improve data wrangling on those challenging uh, signals. And the main advantage of these tools is these are all integrable with data science environments. So actually, we can create scripts from them, as I do here, and use them on new data, uh, deploy them, put them uh, in um, yeah, production that is yeah, really um, useful. For example, uh, the TS Flex toolkit is, for example, um, used to um, yeah for machine learning models that do activity uh, recognition and um, stress prediction. Okay, so now we're at an uh, intermezzo, uh, and uh, this is uh, how I yeah, see to make progress and impact in the academics, and the key seems to be open access. Um, so, um, for example, uh, what can you yeah, make open access your data, your code and documentation, uh, and there are really ubiquitous platforms, pun intended, uh, to com communicate with the community, for example, um, publicly resampled, these are all issues of various users over the last month. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and yeah, you can see that we really can interact with the community and yeah, raise our toolkits level to yeah, uh, a level that we couldn't make it before because we cannot envision all the use cases that it could be used on. Um, and I think open access is cert certain certainly useful in the computer science domain. And yeah, I saw that you, you uh, your research group already did a fair amount of open access by using yeah, the WSAT and PPG uh, data data sets which you made uh, open access. Um, for example, how do I see the impact of what I do? Uh, these are actually the total downloads of the toolkits that we created. So yeah, I have, uh, we have uh, almost 50,000 downloads of uh, the Poppy Resampler and uh, almost 30,000 uh, downloads of uh, TS Flex. And actually, um, I'm now talking with uh, the developers of the PyCare repository to integrate Poppy Resampler into their toolkit. So actually, we're helping also other open source packages or yeah, com collaborating with other open source toolkits to improve also their functionality. So I think this is the best way to make impact, but that is not that yeah, academically valid. Uh, and also to state, uh, for example, the PPG data dataset, it has already 35 
thousand uh, hits on uh, the web and uh, the wasteland even has more it has 128,000 uh, hits so that's really a lot of uh, yeah people who yeah, went on that site i don't think the downloads are mentioned but i think uh, as it has around 300 citations of paper i presume that there are also a lot of downloads uh, and yeah of course uh, for academics uh, at least uh, in, uh, at Ghent University, impact is uh, mostly measured using uh, academic output, which is still considered papers. So yeah, we need still to write papers, but yeah, I tend to believe that that is not the ideal way to go because my yeah, the impact that I created during those two years that I now do research is mainly um, yeah, materialized through the users of my toolkits and not through the papers that I wrote. But yeah, that is a discussion. Um, that I yeah, cannot yeah, make or make decisions on, but I can just only throw it up to other people as I do now. Uh, and um, yeah, that's uh, just what I wanted to say. Um, and then uh, what I work on, part two, uh, is the M-Brain uh, study. So this is the more applied study where we aim to uh, shift from self-reporting to monitoring for improved migraine management. Um, the study is done in collaboration with the neurology department of uh, Ghent University Hospital. And what do we do? Um, <coughs> sorry, uh, we aim to improve actually headache disorder follow up. So first we will look at the current clinical practice. So you have patients diagnosed with chronic headache disorders, for example, migraine or cluster headache. And these patients, yeah, uh, their headache is continuously evolving. They, they can have periods with uh, more headaches, with less headaches. Um, and they <clears throat> will consult uh, their physician rather sporadic in phases that their headache is evolving. And um, that consultation is often face to face. And in that consultation, the physician will query the patient uh, about his or her headache experiences. Um, and these yeah, consultations are really subjective because a patient needs to recall all the information that he or she uh, has about uh, her or his headache. And uh, that is often rather limited because, for example, most, uh, yeah, everybody is susceptible to the peak end rule. So you will remember the peak of an experience and the end of it. So for example, if you had three months of uh, headache data and at the last week you had a lot of headaches, you would tend to say that the period was rather worse than it objectively was. So um, actually there is a need for objective data to more improve this follow-up and make more objective decisions. Well, the first step to do this is using headache diaries. And currently, there are ways to perform uh, paper-based headache diaries, but these are rather limited because you can only yeah, take uh, whether, whether you had a headache or not, your pain score, whether you took a treatment. But what if you have multiple headaches in one day or some headaches overlap? It is not that convenient to fill in. As a result, some digital versions were created, for example, migraine buddy, but these are also still in some ways limited because you cannot provide all contextual information you want to give and cannot be used by physicians to um, yeah, analyze all data you might want to uh, see. So to, to that end, uh, the Embrane study was created and we had a, a, go a goal where we would shift from that self-reporting either with paper-based diaries or those self-reporting apps to collecting continuous and objective data. And to do this, we use wearables and smartphones, and this is then used to improve the migraine management. And how do we do that? Um, so the patients will fill in some data about the headaches they have. We can then automatically classify which type of headache that is. Um, we create a dashboard for physicians, which will summarize relevant properties of that data to guide the discussion between the patient and physician in a more objective manner. And we create a setup where we can investigate new research questions. Um, so, um, how does Embrain look like? Here you can see a, a picture, a screenshot of the app. So, you, users have a timeline in which they see events. These events are actually automatically generated through wearing the wearable. The data is sent to the cloud, and we make real time predictions of their activities they are doing, their stress, whether they have stress or not, uh, their sleeping events. And they can then interact with these timeline events. And then they also fill in their headache attacks, their medication, and we use that then to actually create a dashboard for the physician and perform data analysis uh, upon. 
So uh, as variable, we use Empatica E4. It collects uh, yeah, those data modalities. It sends uh, the data via Bluetooth connection to the phone, which then on its end uh, uploads the data to the cloud. Here in the cloud, our machine learning models run, uh, which then, <coughs> sorry, output timeline events. Um, but we also collect smartphone data. And actually, we collect a lot of smartphone data. This is why we needed ad ethical clearance <laughs> for a study. Uh, for example, we collect keyboard usage, not which type of character, but when a character is pressed, because there's a really interesting research question tied to that. Does typing speed alter when a headache is nearing? Maybe, um, yeah, it does. And this, uh, by collecting this uh, data, we can more yeah, objectively investigate this. Um, additionally, phone behavior, those are uh, patients that uh, use the phone more or less in the period before a headache attack. A cellular connectivity, that is actually a really useful signal to determine whether someone is inside the building or outside, because the cellular strength signal will vary greatly when someone switches from inside a car or a building or outside. Um, barometer, uh, yeah, air pressure or air, or yeah, weather uh, can, it's, it's a proxy for that. And light intensity and loudness are often described as symptoms for headache attacks. So. It's also relevant to capture uh, those modalities and actually to see whether we are able to yeah, detect most activities on the phone. We also collect movement data on the phone and location data to actually uh, enhance some timeline events. For example, on a patient, does a, a dynamic timeline event, for example, walking, can then show the start and end position of a walk. Um, and this is then all used to output in uh, these timeline events. Uh, for example, uh, this is a uh, here you can see a sleeping event um, of a certain uh, patient, then a walking event um, and a stress event. Uh, you see that each type of event has a different color. And for some events, there are also check marks next to them. These check marks uh, indicate that actually these are timeline events that are predicted by the machine learning models, but are not yet validated by the user. When the user uh, yeah, uh, determines that this event is co correct, he can tick on this check mark and then it will disappear as uh, is uh, yeah, shown here. Additionally, when you, for example, tick on this walking event just here in, on, this, on this region, it will yeah, fold out and you see more details. For example, um, yeah, this is a timeline event of me uh, where I just uh, walked from one part in Ghent to another part uh, and it shows some additional details such as my speed, my cadence and my activity index. Um, this we do we also do this to expose users more to their uh, data keeping them a little more motivated to to wear the wearables throughout the whole study because uh, yeah we saw that uh, yeah actually incorporating more data insights that yeah, really improved user interaction um you can also semantically annotate locations for example uh, i annotated my girlfriend's apartment here and uh, then um, yeah it also helps me to recall better um where, uh, yeah, whether that event is correct or not. Um, and um, next to this, we also have, for example, uh, uh, questionnaires. For example, stress, uh, we detect stress with the variables, but it's really hard to detect stress in yeah, ambulatory environments. Because for example, when I'm watch watching a sports uh, final, for example, the last one kilometer of a, a cycling race, my heart rate will go up, I might start sweating, but I'm not moving. So I have a, I have a non-activity uh, related arousal, uh, but actually my internal perception of that event is not stressed. I'm positively excited. So that is actually not stress for me. So then uh, whether when that uh, machine learning model will predict that I will have stress, I will decline it and I will, uh, uh, and then a questionnaire will pop up whether the user has time to fill in a questionnaire about that stress misprediction. And then we query for, for example, uh, uh, the causes that uh, yeah the model might have predicted that he or she was uh, stressed and then we will in the next version look at those other contextual data modalities that we capture whether we can improve the stress detection algorithm um, and next to this we also query um, for the user's uh, mood uh, on a daily level uh, and user stress level on a daily level uh, using morning and evening questionnaires these are also uh, used to actually uh, validate some assumptions. For example, we query whether the number of headache attacks of the last day that the participant gave in was correct or not. This way we can enhance our data quality and make less assumptions that the user, uh, that what the user gave in was totally correct. Uh, so 
Um, this is uh, what we do next to this. Uh, yeah, headaches needs also to be filled in. So uh, there is a headache tab where patients can fill in the locations where, they, where the headache occurred, their intensity, the start and end time, and associated symptoms. And finally, you have also the medicine events uh, which uh, patients can give in to uh, also yeah, add additional context data for the physician. Um, this is then all uh, visualized in a dashboard, and this is actually the first uh, draft of such a dashboard, where we can see actually a timeline of uh, activity events of that patient. Um, we can see uh, here the last four locations of the headache uh, attacks that the patient uh, had, the most uh, taken medicines, uh, the associated most uh, yeah, detected associated symptoms uh, on which days the headaches occurred. Uh, and this can then be used by the physician in a more objective manner to guide the interview. Um, so yeah, this is somewhere where we add with the Embrain uh, study. So we can we have a first situation where we can make physicians sharper and visualize what they couldn't see before. But with each uh, ambulatory study, these are still baby steps because there are so many challenges and limitations. For example, uh, collecting data on smartphones or obtaining a continuous Bluetooth connection with various types of smartphones is really hard. And that smartphone heterogeneity needs to be acknowledged. Additionally, transitioning existing clinical knowledge about headaches or yeah, stress or other um, clinical uh, related uh, yeah, events to real life settings is rather hard. Um, and also keeping users motivated and using uh, yeah, improving that self-reporting to make as few assumptions as possible, verify uh, as a result, verify as much events as possible, but still limit their, the burden that we impose on those patients or or yeah, make them as motivated enough to keep going on is really hard. And next to this, Empatica is actually not a perfect wearable. Uh, their SDK is not that uh, perfect, for example. And the Bluetooth connection is lost uh, between the phone and the Empatica. The Empatica immediately shuts down. There is no additional functionality to go reconnect modus. So we need to yeah, hack our app to create some notifications to users that they need to reconnect manually because we cannot implement that functionality for them. And finally, wearables need to be charged. A connection can get lost. Um, users do not wear the wearable all the time, so you have missing data. How do you deal with missing data to perform like data analysis in an objective manner? So these are really, for me, one of the most interesting things of the study, because all these challenges and limitations are also highly relevant to measure with uh, respect to peers or others who want to reproduce or pursue also studies in that kind of domain. So this is also why I, why I yeah, go uh, that thoroughly uh, about this slide. Um, and um, what we do, for example, is um, we, we actually, yeah, not babysit, but we thoroughly analyze the user's interactions uh, with the, uh, the, the app during the study. So we uh, perform real-time uh, interaction rate analysis. We uh, look, uh, we perform visual analytics so we can intervene at real-time manners, uh, whether uh, a patient is performing well or not, or whether a problem is occurring. Uh, so I will now uh, show uh, a visual uh, yeah, interaction rate analysis. So here, this is uh, yeah, data from a patient. Uh, and on these four subplots, you can see relevant information about the app. On the x-axis, you see the date. Uh, so each uh, yeah, bar is a day. Uh, and on the two, uh, first two subplots, you actually see um, the data we gather of that patient during the day. So a bar represents a period of uh, where continuous data is gathered. And what do we see for most phone data sessions? From zero hours to zero hours. So we have a whole day of phone data for most of the days. But you can see still gaps can occur between phone data. The phone can be shut down or um, other things can occur. Um, and for the wearable data, you can already see that there are way more bars during one day because, as I stated, the connection can get lost, the wearable needs to be charged. So we can actually see already that that user um, yeah, has several um, yeah, re manual reconnections during that day. Um, and for, for two periods, he or she did not wear uh, the wearable uh, at all. So. Actually, that is all already relevant to know. Uh, maybe he or she did also not interact with all the daily records during that uh, second period. Uh, these are the food intake events that he or she gives in. And these uh, yeah, triangles give in, uh, yeah, in illustrate whether uh, he or she answered uh, 
the morning and evening questionnaires. And finally, we also see um, some uh, red uh, bars here, and this indicates actually the headache attacks. So we have also directly an overview uh, of the headache attacks of that patient. So using these visualizations, we can uh, see at one glance, um, does all the data or does most of the data come in correctly? Um, is he or she interacting properly? Because these, uh, this lower graph gives uh, illustrates how much of the events um, the user uh, interacts with, how much does uh, he or she decline or uh, accepts. And we can then see at one glance how he or she is evolving through time. Um, so this is, for, for example, interaction um, rate analysis uh, dashboard. Um, next to this, yeah, we also have, um, as I showed before in that other dashboard, uh, we create some data analysis uh, dashboards. For example, um, I would think if I put this out, and we'll fetch to third of uh, June. I hope it works. Yeah, uh, for example, now you can see all uh, activity model predictions of that user throughout the period. And we can then use that uh, for to quickly observe uh, whether um, yeah, the activity model predictions make sense, uh, whether uh, we see a visual trend between headaches and uh, activity model predictions, and actually, yeah, look uh, with regard to other uh, signal modalities, uh, for example, skin conductance data, uh, whether it makes sense or not. Uh, so um, this is uh, some way uh, we use uh, that uh, data. Um, and um, yeah, now we're in the second phase of performing that data analysis. Uh, of the already collected data, which is rather large, I would say. We have more than 600 gigabytes of data now, uh, ma mainly the smartphone data. Um, uh, that is uh, the yeah, high-frequent uh, modality. And uh, yeah, now we perform the data analysis, which is rather challenging because yeah, we have here, for example, a headache attack, but there is a gap uh, here. What do we do with that gap? Do we omit that for data analysis? Um, or do we incorporate that with another way? Um, so, yeah, it makes it really challenging, uh, but uh, yeah, also interesting. Uh, so um, this is uh, the demo I wanted to give. And now um, the last part uh, of the talk, uh, collaboration ideas. Um, so uh, actually, uh, my uh, FAO uh, and uh, yeah, my funding allows me to do a three-month internship abroad. Um, probably I will not do it uh, now because yeah, I'm actually still in my first year of FWO funding, uh, and I still have some yeah, that M-Brain study uh, on which I'm actively uh, involved, uh, on which I yeah, tend to collaborate uh, closely with a neurologist in a yeah, physical manner. So I sit together with them. So, uh, I, but I think in maybe one or two years, I, I will do an internship uh, abroad. And yeah, actually, as I stumbled uh, a few times on the uh, uh, I think yeah, it might be a good fit to do it uh, over there. And actually, I have already also an idea on what I could possibly do it. Um, and this is actually a, a data set that uh, we collected internally uh, of 10 participants, which were uh, multiple variables for two weeks. Um, and we uh, use a polar H10 uh, to yeah, get ground truth ECG data. And then we collect a photoplatysmogram data from multiple variables. For example, the Imagechild Plus um, does an internally developed variable from uh, on a research group uh, with which I'm uh, associated and the Empathica E4. And the aim actually of yeah, that data is to improve and assess the generalizability or transferability of current machine learning ECG to PPG techniques. Um, so um, that data actually just now sits on our servers and we have yeah, no one working on it. Uh, so it's yeah something that can be either collaborated upon or yeah be uh, yeah, or I could work on that maybe in an internship uh, with uh, you. Uh, and um, yeah, I can also, for example, just show uh, that data. So here you see, uh, for example, data of me, patient Jonas. Um, and uh, you see that uh, I have uh, variable data, so accelerometer data from the Empathica, uh, accelerometer data from the uh, Chill Plus, and uh, the polar movement data. And uh, yeah, I just uh, showed now this. Uh, movement data because you can easily see then whether the data is yeah, roughly synchronized or not. And you can yeah, actually see here, I think I started running. Um, 
And then, yeah, you can actually see that the synchronization is okay. And now I can, for example, show the uh, photoplatismogram uh, data or the bot volume pulse from the Empatica and the ECG from the Polar. And uh, yeah, actually, you can then use those um, data modalities uh, to uh, try to uh, improve current uh, uh, machine learning models uh, for uh, heartbeat detection. But yeah, you can see <laughs> Empatica uh, BVP, it's hard to discern a pattern. Uh, so yeah, you, as deep PPK that uh, you need, yeah, often to convert it into a spectral pattern. Uh, uh, and yeah, here you can roughly see the bumps, I think, in the PPG uh, here in that region. Yeah, the heart rate. Uh, but uh, the alignment is still not uh, done. It's just raw data that I show here. So um, yeah, but it's a data set that is, yeah, like for me, it's, I think, all these days that we have data from. So yeah, it's, and we have that from, yeah, multiple patients here. So yeah, it's, it, it, it just sits here on our servers and I think it can be salvaged in some way. Um, and I, I think uh, that was uh, the end of uh, my talk. So uh, I'm happy to uh, open up a discussion or take some questions about uh, the things I do. Uh, and certainly if you use uh, toolkits that uh, yeah, we make, uh, yeah, you can create issues on GitHub or provide additional information on how to improve it uh, as well. Uh, or yeah, and I make an example and also upload uh, or, and create a pull request on our GitHub to yeah, actually make it more easy, easy to use for others. Uh, and um, yeah, that was it, uh, I guess. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonas. I think it resonated on several levels, uh, from the low level need for uh, more tools to the high level questioning whether you know uh, papers are everything, whether we should not also look at at um, furthering science in other ways. 